I have found the way to uh, master a thing is to uh, simplify. As our meetings are drawing to a close, I'd like to simplify this whole field of, of the mastery of life. Uh, there are 615, 614 rules in the Pentateuch for the conduct of life. Those were reduced to um, uh, 15 in the 11th uh, Psalm. Um, Micah reduced them to three, do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with thy God. <coughs> Jesus reduced them to one, love. Love the Lord thy God with all thy strength and all thy mind and all thy heart and all thy soul. This is the great commandment. I have found that if you can learn how to love God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength, you're a well-educated person. You wouldn't need to go to school. You wouldn't need to go to have a college degree if you really mastered those by putting yourself in alignment and letting it flow out in the form of, uh, in a, uh, well, just like you breathe. If religion becomes to you uh, nearer than breathing, just like the breath of your nostrils. Now, life is conducted by rhythm. You get the radio, it comes by rhythm. Little vibrations through the air. Uh, you go out on the spring day like this and sit under the trees and listen to the little brook, and it's rhythmical. You feel your pulse, it's, uh, it's an alternate beat. You look at the waxing and the waning of the moon, the ebbing and the flow of the tides, uh, alternation of day and night. Everything moves in rhythm. So if you can love God with all your heart, mind, and soul and, live, and, uh, and uh, really master that, uh, you'll find you'll be doing it in somewhat in rhythm. Now, <clears throat> I have wanted to establish an ideal college. Someday we're going to do that. But I was dean of... Uh, uh, McAllister College for many years, and I had to look over their uh, application blanks, their, their certificates of admission, and I didn't, uh, I had to check up and see they all came from an accredited high school, and I got tired looking at those sheets of paper. I didn't care whether they came from an accredited high school. I wanted to look at the boy. I wanted to be sure he was an accredited boy. Edison couldn't have gotten into McAllister College. Lincoln couldn't have gotten in. He went back a little farther. Plato couldn't have gotten in. There's Shakespeare. In fact, all the, the ones I'd want to have in my college couldn't get in. Any little cigarette-smoking fellow that had gotten through the high school by the skin of his teeth, he might get in. I didn't care. I wanted to look at something bigger than that. Well, here was... Uh, so I'm going to outline uh, to you what I, uh, this college, and I believe that presently I'll have the blackboard put up on the platform so that it'll be above uh, where you can see all the detail of it. I'm going to let you uh, get it in a graphic way. <clears throat> um, I had the privilege of training under the greatest athletic trainer, I think, in the world, Jack Watson. And uh, he uh, used a philosophy different than other coaches. And the result is that at Grinnell College, a small college, we belonged in the big four. We were one of the big four, they call it, although we had 300 students, and we, the other three of the big four were um, uh, University of Iowa, Ames, and Drake University. And I guess for 20 years, um, Grinnell always got either first place or second place in the state meet. And in the football games, if we uh, were behind in the, in the first half, we could always win in the second half. He always played better the second half. And old Jack Watson would say to us on Friday before the game, now all you men lie down, don't come out and practice. The coach, he wasn't the coach, he was the trainer. The coach uh, would insist they wanted them to come out and go through the signals. No, you just go to bed Friday afternoon, and every minute you're resting, you're storing up strength you're going to use in that second half, and we had it. They'd put 11 men in the game, and the same 11 would come out, iron men. 
Now they have three sets of backs in all these teams. They have to have uh, alternate substitutes and substitutes. I've often thought if uh, Jack Watson or if I could get in there with just 11 men. Now down at William and Vashti College, a little college where I started out by teaching at just brand new college, we only had 11 men for the football team. They were all freshmen because this is a new college. Now it, doesn't so it might sound like I'm trying to boast, but I'm not. <laughs> we went down, we defeated Knox. Mon, Iowa Wesleyan, the oldest college in the Middle West, we defeated 30, uh, 18 to nothing. And uh, now I'm going to tell you what we did. The other men wore their men out by working them too hard, and I, I used a rhythm. I'm going to show you in just a minute. Draw a line and put above that line tension. Tension's a value. You tense up your muscles and uh, all the blood is forced out of this, uh, this tissue. You relax and the blood comes flowing in. If you're tensed all the time, you just destroy. But if you're just relaxed all the time, there'd be no uh, stimulus for the, uh, um, to bring the blood in. It's to be the rhythm. And the trouble is these young athletes, they go out and they tense, 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 and they don't have enough relaxation. And so, if the camp's farthest out, we introduced this rhythm, which some of you participated in this morning and yesterday. And you will discover that while there's a little tension, it really is, it fills in that necessary relaxation. Muriel Lester, she gets, comes to America, about the first thing she does is to make a beeline to Alice Craft or Marsha Brown and say, I want to have a little exercise with a poppy head and take out that stiff neckness that they get over in England. Well. Relaxation. <laughs> Tension, relaxation. Uh, the greatest trainer of rowing crews in the world says that crew that gets the most rest between strokes wins, always wins the race. So the art of learning how to rest as you work, as you wash dishes, do it in a relaxed way, do all those things. I'd like to have a college that before they got out of it, they would find themselves doing everything. Uh, without burning up their energy, they could work three times as long because they would um, uh, use that method. One of the teachers of the camp farthest out was engaged by the uh, great store in, the, in the Boston. It wasn't Fee Baker, it was begins with an F though. Fire, fire, what? Filene. Uh, they had hundreds of employees, girls who worked on, on, stood on their feet all day long. He would have him come and give them lessons in what they called rest working. Uh, learn how to have a relaxed neck on the top of a, of a balanced uh, spine. And they found they could work without energy, without, without wearing themselves out. At the end of the day, they'd be as fresh as in the beginning, and they found they'd simply increase the efficiency. So they, they, they we're going to see a uh, more and more, and it may go out of the camps farthest out, this whole idea of uh, working with less str uh, strain. I was going around, I used to go around with a, I found the most difficult thing in prayer is to let go. So I opened up the Bible in a prayer group down in Mobile, and I went around and I said, now I'm going to ask you to lay your burdens upon those promises, but don't lay them there if you're going to take them up again. And one woman held her hand there so long, I thought the sun would go down and the stars come out, and I wondered how I'd, uh, I asked the Lord silently how to take her hand away, and then I blurted out, when you go to bed tonight, you let the bed hold you up and don't you hold up the bed. <laughs> and she gave a great smiled and took her hand away. And the next morning at the meeting, she said, why did you say that? I said, what? About letting the bed hold me up. Did you know that my chief problem was insomnia? I hadn't slept for five nights. And, and last night, I let the bed hold me up. And I had the best sleep I've had in five years. Well, that's the thing to learn how to do. And it'll help you learn how to pray when you learn how to relax your body. We found at the Cap's Father's Town one of the reasons why the prayer power is so great 
is through these rhythm things, which some, sometimes the ministers are the ones that question them, and the, the ministers at the end are the ones enthusiastic about it. They say that that has increased my efficiency so much. I've just been going there so tense. I, some of them go through a little rhythm in their study before they go out to give the sermon. Well, I'm done here to come here to talk to you about uh, physical culture. I came in here to teach you how to pray, and that's only one, but that's a part of it. And if you love God all your mind, above the line where you put the attention, we put enthusiasm. As I say, if you come to my college, I wouldn't care what college, you, uh, whether you come from an accredited school, but I put you through two tests. Do you have capacity for enthusiasm, and do you have capacity for stillness? Teaching in a high school in Des Moines, the first two years, my teaching experience from high school, and I was reading from a, a story of uh, Robert Louis Stevenson, and I saw the time is about up, and I said, well, I'll have to stop here and, and continue at the next. I'd given them a little assignment, assignment of some kind, but I was using this for a story I was reading for purposes. I'll have to finish it the next time. And a little boy in the front seat said, go on, go on. And of course, everybody laughed, and he got red in the face, and his ears got red and embarrassed. I felt like saying, Vernon, you belong in my college. You have such enthusiasm, you forgot everybody. Edison gets so enthusiastic, he didn't forget his meals. That young man did go to Grinnell College and became an outstanding literary leader there. That's all I want to know whether you're enthusiastic or not. Then I've written a textbook on the art of the short story. It's a little different than most textbooks. It came out in 1922, just 30 years ago. All the other textbooks of that decade have vanished away off the shelves, but mine going on because it seemed to have something they liked was this. Instead of beginning with a definition, what's the difference? What is a short story? What's the difference between a short story and a tale and a fable? Hmm. There's a door there. Here's a door. Do you begin by defining that door? No, the door is something to go through. You're putting the cart before the horse if you stop, begin by having to define a short story. They all know what that. I just put on a sentence on the board. Old Uncle John sitting, sitting in his big armchair before the fire smoking his pipe. I said, now close your eyes and see the picture. Be just relax now until you begin to see the picture. Wait until the light lights up the room and the face and you see the shadows and you begin to see the wrinkles coming out on his face and he begins to be a different old Uncle John than anyone else and the room's different from any other room. Wait until it becomes clear and then, then write it as fast as you can. Well, I'd see a boy in the back seat poking at another boy. Bill, you're going to sleep. Say, Harry, what girl are you going to take the party tonight? I'm sorry, Bill and Harry, but you don't belong in my college because you can't get still. And then after they've been still a while in the picture, I'd say, now write fast with enthusiasm. Oh, don't wait for spelling. You can uh, come back to uh, or punctuation. I've got a salt and pepper shaker with a lot of commas and periods in it. I can help salt and pepper if necessary. What I want is the picture. I don't even care whether the, the writing is a very fine penmanship. I, the genius is they write in between. And Then when it's all finished, I say, now I'll look it over and correct it in cold blood, what you've written in hot blood. And it turned out geniuses. I want to tell you right here that before we go a step farther, that this college would uh, turn out great athletes. Over here, over the love God with all thy body, that is all thy strength, uh, a proper attention, become heroes. Over here in the mind, become retrained geniuses. Over there under the heart, the heart would be over there with the desire, train the train uh, uh, prophets and over the, and the soul would of God, all that soul, you train saints. Wouldn't it be wonderful to go to college where you turn out to be a hero and a genius and a prophet and a saint? Well, I want to go on to this about this genius business. All geniuses have that as two capacities, and that's all that's necessary. I know a lot of folks that graduate and they're bored and they won't have, uh, 
don't want any more learning. It's just bored them to death. What, they, what we want is to develop enthusiasm and the power to be still. A great artist told me that the method of all the artists is this. For instance, he was, an, he was a sculptor. He said, um, some millionaire will ask me to give me a commission to build a statue of a boy fishing for his uh, pond. And his. So he said, I, I'll plant that in the back of my mind with a desire to bring it forth in, in beauty. Then I go off and forget it for several months. Finally, you may write me and say, well, how do you get along? Then I'll go and lie down with my head in the shade and my feet in the sun or from the house, lie down my feet toward the fire and my head away from it and I'll just get still. Just get still and presently the whole vision of exactly the statue comes. Then I just go at it with enthusiasm. You get that combination. You've got genius. I'll illustrate that. There's only one person, one type of person that I have an allergy toward. Uh, that is sissy boys. When I, when I was a boy, sissy boys, especially egotistical ones. <coughs> when I went to Harvard, I, uh, I was registering, and I heard a young lady say, I don't think I'll take Chaucer. I looked down the line. There's only men, of course. After a while, I heard the lady speak again. I looked under the table. No ladies anywhere. When I went to the Randall Eating Club, where we, uh, uh, this is postgraduate work, there's a postgraduate young man. Uh, he said, you're postgraduate? And I said, yes. Graduate said, well, I'm picking out 26 chaps to sit for the whole year at, a, at the table, at the, my table. I've been a little concerned, coming from a college like Grinnell, whether I ever make any friends in just one year in a university. You can make more friends in one year in a small college than you can in four years in a university. Small college, more, a big university, more college goes through the boy, but, or rather the boy goes through more college, but in a small college, more, boy, more college student goes through the boy. And so I was sitting there, 26 of us, and then he began to introduce us. Uh, Glenn Clark, I was from Des Moines. This is Glenn Clark. I want you to meet Roger Williams from Washita, Arkansas. Oh, Mr. Clark, just like a clock, isn't it? And there was that uh, falsetto. <laughs> I said, if I can sit, if I can sit at the same table with that creature, it'll be a test of my endurance. But Roger Williams, when he'd come from uh, Kittredge's class for the lunch hour, he'd say, "Fellas, you know what happened." No, enthusiastic, or he took a walk in the afternoon, he'd tell us about it. Everybody wanted to sit by him because enthusiasm, you'll overcome any multitude of sins. <coughs> <laughs> he told me, praised his grandmother so. His mother hadn't had an education because she was born uh, after the Civil War. And they didn't get any education. Just the Negroes were educated that for a while after that. Money was sent down from the South, but the but, her, but his mother, that before the war, she knew Shakespeare and everything, the grandmother. One day he said, I've got a picture of my grandmother. They just sent me one. Come up to my room. And I went up and spread out a lot of photographs and looking around. And over here, I was on a picture of an old, looked like an old Cherokee hag of some kind, all wrinkles. So I can't find her anywhere. And I said, who's this old squirrel? Oh, that's my grandmother. <laughs> Enthusiasm. No apology. We went to a, see. A, we went to see Marlowe and Southern in the in Hamlet. We sat up with the gods, and in the last act, in the last scene, I heard him say, "I said, what's the matter? Did you hear that? No. What was it? Absinthe from Felicity of Wilde, Horatio. Wasn't that wonderful? So I love to sit beside him." Get the responses and the reactions. Why, that's life. I'd like to have a college just filled with boys and girls like that. But if you're enthusiastic all the time, you'll be a subject for the state hospital. <laughs> if you're still all the time, you'll be like these uh, folks that I may be seeing as I ride through the South. 
sat on the front porch and think, and sometimes they just sat. Now, the, uh, <coughs> the combination, you see, it's the rhythm. Like walking a tightrope. They need training in it. There came a boy to Mc uh, Grinnell College when I was there, a member of my class, fresh from the country, right from the hick uh, kind of a chap. He had outgrown his clothes, his uh, arms hung out of his sleeves, just like Ichabod Crane. He had an awkward walk, and he, he had a kind of a falsetto, but he put pebbles in his mouth and brought it down, became a good orator before the graduate. But um, I don't think he ever got better than a C. You know, I've been, I was in his classes, and he's usually about the dullest one there. But he went out and sold books at the end of his freshman year, and he sold more books than anybody in the United States. Made enough in one summer to pay his way all through college. He, uh, this company would give a prize every week to the best of the sales, and he'd win the prize in addition to his sales. And he urged me to come out. I said, no, that's the one thing. I'm my mother. It's described the book agents as having little horns and tails, hoofs. Well, he said there's a trainer coming from uh, Chicago, and he's going to train the boys. He'll be up in my room tonight. I'm going to get a little commission on every book sold by these chaps, so I'm actually interested. He said, I wish you'd come up and just see how it's done. I said, well, I'm curious to know how a, a thing of that kind can be done, so I just just come up just to watch. Well, the trainer was about seven feet tall. His legs, and he folded them and clear across the room, and they sat there. And he said, all you have to do is to push the bell, out, the button, and ring the bell and walk in. You don't have any, carry any book. Your mother make a little, a little uh, bag you can wear over your sh shoulder under your coat and carry your prospectus in that. And all you have to do is to memorize three speeches, one for mothers, one for businessmen, and one for other people. <laughs> then what is more, if any of you, if you wouldn't even sell a book. And I picked up my ears. But it'd hold out for 90 days. We'd pay your regular monthly salary. And, and it, well, I finally did the impossible, and I signed up. My mother made the, made this under protest, made the little bag, and I memorized the three speeches. And, I went out, and at the end of the month, I hadn't sold enough books to pay for my board and lodging. And the company saw they were going to lose money, because I'm like the Irishman who said, if you don't look out, I'll stick my nose between your teeth, and I won't let go. <laughs> so I was uh, planning to hold out for 90 days. <laughs> well, the company said, we, we're going to route you to a new territory. We're going to have you... Spend a day, suggest you spend a day at Marshalltown and go around with William Paul and see how he sells books. So William Paul started out. First house was an old ramshackle, no widow lived there, no money. He didn't even try to sell books. But he sat there just as leisurely. I was tense when the morning started, and three in the afternoon I'd go home and wreck. Well, he um, relaxed, enjoyed telling stories and jokes to the old lady, found out all about the folks along there, how their names were, how many children they had, put down a little notebook, and the next house is the big house on the hill. He rang the bell, and the maid came, and uh, is Mrs. Clark in? Why, yes. And so these fine young college boys came in, sat down in the parlor, and Mrs. Clark came in, and Mrs. Clark, I want you to meet Mr. Clark. I wonder if you could be related. I explained to him that all my uncles were aunts in that area. <laughs> Didn't make any difference when he met another Mrs. Clark. He said, I wonder if you can be related. <laughs> Sat down just as relaxedly. A fly lit on his knee, and he caught the fly. That I learned how to catch flies. You don't do it this way. <laughs> perfect relaxation, perfect quietness. Gave her comfortable body tensions until she was very happy to be with us. And then he... Uh, he said that now you've got four little children, and uh, yes, how did you know that? And four little children ask lots of questions that mothers can't answer. That's true. How did you know that? Well, Professor Ruoff, University of Pennsylvania, and knew that, so he's prepared a book. 
Here it is. That I'll answer all those questions the little book group that mothers can't answer. You just sign here, and she signed there, and <laughs> we walked out. <laughs> Six o'clock came, and I said, well, at last, uh, work's over. I, 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 we're out of three. They always said, no, no, we're not over. Uh, at seven o'clock, we'd go down to the uh, factory district where the mothers work also, and the only time to see them is at between seven and nine. So we, from seven to nine, we sold books. Sold more in one day than I'd sold in a month. Then we went to his room. He made me take the cot. He made a bed on the floor. And I said, now, at last... I can, won't have to hear those little speeches. <laughs> Out of the dark, there came a voice. <laughs> Good evening, Mrs. Bedbug. I understand you have a lot of little bedbugs and little bedbugs. Not a question, not a question. Professor Ruoff, the University of Pennsylvania, has written books that little, ask the questions of little bedbugs. I said, why, if a man can sell the books all day and then sell to the Mrs. Bedbug at night, you can't stop him. <laughs> Only got C's. I don't care where they'd flunked. No, I said, brilliant about him. He decided to go into the ministry, and he, he said, go on and come on. He still says it. He doesn't say coming and going. How would he ever get up to Mr. Fosdick's church, something like that? But he is at the head of the greatest rescue mission in the world. Hundreds of thousands of, of lumberjacks go through. He has a whole hotel, St. James Hotel. By the way, if you get up there and Minneapolis don't have any money, you just go and he'll give you, they'll give you a pail of water and a room and you can earn your own board and you'll have a <laughs> lodging and supper. And he has a whole farm out there that is, uh, that the down and outers can go out and get built up. He's been president of the rescue mission heads so over, I think, for years and years of America. He has voted the most valuable citizen in Minneapolis, and uh, he received an honorary doctor's degree from Grinnell the year before I got mine. <laughs> I might say, now, how many of you here are fortunate enough not to have a college education? Put your hands up. <laughs> well, sir, all you need is enthusiasm and stillness, and we'll make something really can go places now. I hope college didn't sc scrape all that out of you other folks that graduated. Well, now, <clears throat> let us go over to training the heart. I would like to ask boys and girls that came to my college, what is it you desire most of all? You know, in India, they, they say you should suppress your desires. Just Quill them. Just sit there without any desires at all. That's the way to become a saint. Jesus didn't say that. The folks that he made the most of were folks of tremendous desires. Peter just bubbled out and say things. No, you mustn't do this, and you must do that. James and John asked if one could be at the first uh, 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 sinner's right hand, one at his left hand. Desires are wonderful things. I'd like to just ask my boys and girls when they come, I would say, this is going to be a kind of a confessional. No one will know what you're saying, but I want an honest statement. What is it you'd like to have happen to you in this four years in college more than anything else in all the world? And this husky-shouldered boy would say, I'd, I'd like to be made captain of the football team. But don't tell the fellas, they climb my frame. I'd ask this girl, I'd like to be Queen of the May. Uh, or the chief thing I'd come to this educational farm is to find the right boy for my partner. I'd like to have them tell me those things and be honest about it. Don't be ashamed of desires. Have them. But then learn this capacity. The desire only becomes powerful when you relinquish it. When you say, Lord, if there's something better... Then you, then you have the perfect rhythm or the perfect prayer. Uh, the folks that go around and say, I don't want to take over in India. Those are the saints, so-called saints, the masters that just repress all their desires. It bursts forth in all kinds of perversions, all kinds of uh, mental conditions, and all kinds of things.
I'm just saying this. It would be healthy if in every college there'd be one professor, we'll say a dean, a man and dean of women. They're the ones that trust the least, usually, because they usually stand there with a the big stick. If they could just honestly tell them exactly what's the deepest thing in their heart. And I'm unashamed about it. Even tell them what their biggest temptation is, unashamed about it. Just to tell it out, you know, things happen. And then tell them to relinquish it. Just a side to track for us for a moment. I don't know why I'm on this subject, but I've never brought this out before in this way. But there's a young woman of 18 that had a morbid uh, fear of r running water. It's described in the um, first chapter in um, Overstreet's uh, Psychology. Uh, she was examined by doctors. There's nothing the matter with her physically, nor nervously, or mentally. But from the time she was five, the teachers would pass the word on to the next teacher when she'd pass to the next room. Don't have that Mary sit by the window, because if it rains and she hears the dripping water, she'll go into hysterics. She couldn't even wash her teeth without dipping the water just in the brush in the glass. Her uh, mother had to prepare the bath uh, for her before she could go in there and take the bath. One day when she was 18, an, an aunt came and she said, uh, Mary, it's been a long time since I've seen you. You're five years old. How have you changed? Say, Mary, would it be all right for us to tell our little secret to your mother now? And, well, I guess so. And this was the secret. When I was here last time, your mother let me take, uh, take you to the, uh, to the uh, park. It made me promise I would not let you out of my sight. And remember, I fell asleep on the bench. And when I woke up, I couldn't see any sight of you. And I got scared. I was hurrying along. And I suddenly could hear your screams coming from where the waterfalls were. And I went there, and I found that you'd gone behind the waterfall, and your foot had got caught with some rocks, and you couldn't get loose. And you'd been screaming there. And you know, you, promised, you made me promise I wouldn't tell on you. And I, I was glad not to have to tell your mother anyway on myself. From that moment, that thing was all lifted. No more fear. Psychiatrists just would have worked to have them, you know, tell these past, past till they finally will tell that written thing. Well, it's uh, wholesome. It'd be healing to be able to tell your desires and tell your dangerous temptations and ask for help <coughs> there. You see what a wonderful thing to have a college that would uh, make a sort of a rule of that? Then to desire a thing and relinquish it, that's the rhythm. When I was nine years old, my cousin Carrie, and I, she was nine also, were talking over our future. When children get to be nine, that's about the time they begin to think of what they want to be when they grow up. And uh, she said she wanted to become rich and put on style. Her father was a drunkard and they were poor and uh, she was a, had a beautiful mother. She was a beautiful girl. And I, anything I didn't like was style. My father had plenty of money. We had a nice, uh, but we went out in the country in the summer, and I could hardly wait to get there to get my shoes and stockings off, wear nothing but a pair of overalls and a shirt, and there I'd just be free as air. And anything I hated, I had to dress up, wash my neck and ears, have a necktie put on, and put on style. So to me, that was... Then she said, what do you want to do? I said, I want to become a famous writer. Well, I suppose you want to wear, have long hair and live in a garret. I haven't achieved either of those honors yet. <laughs> but uh, we were honest. Those were honest desires. About 30 years after that, I went to see her in Milwaukee. She's working in a 10 cent store, getting $10 a week, I guess. She hadn't been rich. She said, have you become a famous writer? And I said, no. But it began to dawn on me that my freshmen were doing better writing than I had done when I was a freshman. Of course, they had a better teacher. <laughs> so I relinquished my desire, and I said, Lord, if you'll help me, I'm going to try to turn out famous writers. That'll be my monument. I'll step into the background. And after that, the boy asked me a simple question. I sat down and asked the Lord to help me answer it, and it just flowed out. The Atlantic said, send us half a dozen more like it. And the next year, the Atlanta had a little write-up of a set, of, got a little booklet of its writers. They featured me and said that Glenn Clark woke up one morning, found himself famous. Well, 
uh, relinquished it. She got religion. She'd been the most selfish one of my relatives, but she got religion. And she began to, uh, to uh, relinquish things in God's hands. She's walking across the, uh, crossing the street under the arc light one night. <clears throat> a bug got in her eye. She went to the corner drugstore and a handsome, tall stranger <clears throat> took out a clean handkerchief and extracted <clears throat> the bug from her eye. And in the process, he got a bug in his eye. <laughs> And after six months of whirlwind courtship, he proposed to her, and then he broke the news that he was getting $25,000 a year salary, and he wanted her to put on some style. Now, our, um, our prayers came true, but I want to disabuse anyone or uh, step out from any criticism that some folks might say that Glenn Clark <laughs> advocates using God as a cosmic bellboy, just push a button in the prayer's hand. If you ring for hot water and the bellboy waits for 30 years before he brings it up, I don't think you'd call that a bellboy job. Uh, <clears throat> we waited 30 years, you see, before this came to pass. I could just go right down the line, the things we want, and then relinquish them. One thing was this. We had a little, I started this little publishing company. I started it by publishing the uh, this Lord's Prayer, a little booklet that they would have published in the East, the publisher, and charge 40 cents for it. I could publish it and sell it for 15 cents. So I did, and they'd, uh, if they wanted 10 copies, they'd just send a dollar, and we'd send, write the names of the pen, and my wife would write it out, about a dollar came in a day. The next year, I wrote another little book, Song of the Souls of Men, and by this time, they're coming in about $5 a day. <clears throat> I had to have my secretary to take it over. And then I said, well, that's why not just advertise my other books and sell other religious books if they wanted them. And we had to hire a little, uh, a little store, rent it, I mean. And then we found her outgrowing it. And then we looked all over the Twin Cities to find a place we could rent. And there wasn't any place. So I just relinquished it and said, Lord, if you want to have us packed in here, five desks. And then the mailman said, he always stopped and took his hat off and kind of got quiet in that place. He brought his big pile of mail, kept getting bigger and bigger. He said, it's too bad you don't want to buy a place. My uncle died, who owns the mortuary just on the next block. And my, mother, my aunt wants to sell it. But uh, she won't sell it unless they buy it another two stores, an ice cream parlor and a beauty parlor. Or the one of them is completely vacant. No one wanted to have a store right next to a mortuary. Well, I went and looked it over, and it was just perfect, just as it was made for us. Just all the rooms for us. Too, too long and big for other stores. Nobody was wanting it, buying it. The grocery stores wouldn't need it. It's divided up. It's just divided exactly for the, what we wanted. And had a dry basement that would hold 100,000 books. I won't go into detail about it. So I offered her the sum and the cash. I thought we could borrow that much. And Somebody else came along, bid 3,000 more, and I said, well, God, Lord, that's just too bad, just out of our hands. And then uh, two weeks later, she called me up and said, these other two men have been inducted into the army for the war and have called this off, so I'd like to sell it to you. Well, this, this year, I just paid the last cent on the three buildings and uh, made it out for my three children to underwrite their little children through school. Now, I want, I, I, as soon as I want, uh, relinquish a thing, it seems to open up the door. So don't think that prayer is a pushing, a pushing. It's a combination of just frankly telling the Lord what you'd like and give it in his hands. Well, <clears throat> let's just move this uh, uh, over here to love and peace. Now, if you... Uh, <clears throat> Two greatest virtues there are, I think, are love and peace. If you love greatly and learn how to love greatly, and love may be intensely, do you know what you're in for? You're in for some real suffering. You're going to meet some tragedies in life. You're going to have some deep sorrows. You know, there's one thing that we're all, uh, I, I've never known of anyone to escape. I haven't ever heard of anyone that's escaped it, and that's death. And when your brother, 
that I, my brother, that I love closer than anyone in all the world. We planned our life together. I was 14 and he was 10. I was, uh, I was 12 and he was 10. We planned our lives together. When he became 12 and I was 14, the Lord took him into heaven with a new kind of a disease called uh, appendicitis now. And I said, I've got to do the work of two men. And I have felt all these things I'm doing here, the camps and all those things, probably wouldn't have existed. If it hadn't been for such a deep sorrow that it, I, I said, no, no. I just threw myself there. I was only 14. I'd go down to the, said, I've got to train myself someday to be something. And all I know, I don't know what it is, but the Lord's got to use me. And I want to write. So I began to uh, read Hawthorne and Irving and see what kind of, well, the first thing I noticed was they used semicolons. I never knew what semicolons were before. So I write letters to my friends and long sentences and lots of semicolons. <laughs> After I learned how to use them, I, they've sort of gone out of fashion nowadays. But Then I remember Patrick, you know, Henry um, Clay would go down and, uh, every day and make speeches before the cattle and the pigs. And I may someday I may have to make speeches. I didn't have any cattle and pigs, but I had Plymouth Rock chickens. <laughs> so every morning I'd make a five-minute talk as I threw out my corn. And I have never had an audience so responsive to my gestures. <laughs> but I'm telling you this. A great peace came to me when I knew I could be preparing myself to do a work that I wasn't afraid and I was going to throw myself into it. And I haven't yet found anyone that's gone places that haven't had some, some of those things, that, that rhythm. There's an old bachelor who lives up there, lived near us, and each time a man, one man's... Uh, I'm a one-woman man. I was in love, and the woman jilted me. I'm not going to trust another woman. I'm not going to throw myself open to any more hurts. I want to say, throw yourself open to hurts. Be jilted, and be jilted again, and keep on loving. The power comes, then you become a saint. If you can just keep on loving and your faith, I do it. Love. And so, and, and then to get that peace that passeth understanding. Uh, the combination. Anyone can get peace if you have a nice turkey dinner and just sit down and have a... Uh, and that's the, that, that isn't peace, that's, um, that's pleasure. Uh, to go up into ecstasy and bliss and peace, those are higher terms. There's a very beautiful... Uh, a girl at McAllister College when I first went there. She was a senior. One of those faces that somehow you just couldn't forget. Uh, she looked like Mary Pickford, who at that time was the sweetheart of the nation, only she had a spiritual quality even deeper than Mary Pickford. She wasn't in any of my classes. She just, uh, just a face that vanished away. Twelve years after she graduated, that voice spoke to me over the phone and said, This is Leo. And uh, she said, my 10-year-old son, my oldest boy, has infantile paralysis. Will you pray for him? Prof, I just read your book. Well, at last I was going to be able to help that girl. I said, I'd be glad to. A week later, she called up and said, uh, six doctors have sat in consultation and they've left. And they say that, that he won't live through the day. I said, well, just what is the condition? He has been paralyzed from the neck down for a week. He's having two convulsions a minute for the last four hours. He has a temperature of 105. His spine has been punctured 11 times. There's no more relief there. No hope. I said, if your boy were invited by the President of the United States to become Secretary of State and sit at his right hand, you wouldn't urge, insist that he stay at home and resign from that appointment? I know, no, I'd want whatever's best for the boy. Washington and the White House are wonderful places, but they can't compare with heaven, and uh, the president can't compare with God. So 
Supposing God wants him to come up and sit at his right hand in heaven, would you be willing to accept it if it were best for the boy? If it were best for the boy, but I said, if you put that consideration first, that you'd be willing to accept anything that's best for the boy and just relinquish him completely in God's hands, and if you'll just go on and off and be quiet for a while, and I'll do some praying for you right now. An hour later, she called up and she said, I've been on my knees in an upper room. I said, the Lord, this son is not a son of mine. He's a son of God. He just loaned to me. I'm willing to accept, and she said, with radiant acquiescence, whatever's best for the boy. All the relatives came that day to be there when the boy died, to help where they could, and the boy was one of those big relative families, 20, 30, 40 people. She was the base, best cake baker in Minnesota. She baked an angel food cake, put coffee in, chocolate. She served them and uh, cheered them up, that beautiful face of hers, just brightening them all up. And as she'd go into the kitchen to get more coffee, they'd touch their hands to their head and say, she has a peace. It's affected her mind. This strain affected her mind because she has a peace that isn't consistent with a sound understanding. There it was I really learned the power of that promise in the Bible, that statement, the peace that passeth understanding. In three months, that boy's back in school without ever a limp, without even a limp. And whenever a child was in danger or given up, I would just phone to Leo and we'd pray. And in uh, 16 times, uh, 17 times out of the, out of 19 cases of children, the child recovered. To, uh, to uh, the strength comes when the ship's sinking and you have peace. When your business is failing and you just have peace, that's when you prove that you're a saint. Uh, you have a great plane went down on the Pacific waters and uh, went down into the depths, left three little bags of uh, rubber with six or seven men, with no water and no food off the travel lines, and simply no way of escape. Men that would have been uh, gone into hysterics, they could have gone insane. One of them did, more or less, and drank salt water and uh, died. One, the youngest one of all, achieved a peace that passeth understanding, and they, Rick and Backer, stared at him, and others did. He'd uh, pull surreptitiously out of his pocket a little uh, volume and uh, read it and read it. And they said, What is that? It's a testament my uh, chaplain gave me. Well, does it help you? It sure does. Well, what are you reading? Well, I've come across this place. Take no anxious thought what you shall eat and what you shall drink. Your Heavenly Father knoweth. Does it say that? Well, that's not only read that, but they passed it around and they read that and they read that. They didn't know how to pray, but a Texas fellow said he'd try it. He'd begin always this way, old master. Old master, we're going to die if you don't have water. I don't see how we can hold out to 24 hours longer, but we'll have to relinquish it in your hands, old master. See, we need it, but we relinquish it. And the rain came. Time went by, and the old master, we'll have to have food now. We just can't hold out any longer. And a white bird came winging right off out from the shore, lit on the top of uh, Brickenbacker's head. He grabbed it quick. They all had a morsel of food that kept them alive. Time went on, no one, to, uh, and uh, days went by, 17 days. Now, old master, we're going to starve for sure if we can't get something quick. Twelve fish leaped up into their boats. Now, you see, this begins to be the place where they'll say, um, people that might like to criticize uh, my philosophy or our philosophy, say, you see, that's, he believes in magic. He says, twelve fish leaped up into the boat. Well, there's a so kind of a magic for a bird to fly over there, but it's m m more greater magic for these airplanes to fly clear across to Europe. The scientists have seen much more magic than we folks in prayer. They were sending a little flyer, a little flare up every night when it grew dark, just one. They only had a few, so they just sent one up a night and uh, hoping someone would see it. And they sent this one up. 
And if it was waterlogged or something zigzagged around, didn't go as it should, and it came right down on the boats. If it just touched one of those rubber boats, there'd have been at least three men in the bottom of the sea because no other boats were strong enough to support one more. It missed it by an inch. Went into a school of fish, and the fish leaped up into the boats. Now, you see the way those things happen? Well, Dr. George Barton Carver used to tell me, if you pray, things don't just happen. You folks sitting here, uh, you didn't just come here. There's a lady came, I don't know, just arrived. I don't know how far she had to come. The Lord sent her here because she used to hear what I'm to say this afternoon. That's, that's the way I accept things, I mean. Put everything in the hands of God, and you'll find that uh, he'll take charge more and more of all of your life. You're an educated person. If you're trained in those rhythms, and if you, in this one hour, those of you who haven't had a college education, come up here and I'll sign your diplomas. And if you really got this, you'll be better educated than nine tenths of those who spent four years in college and that don't have this. I speak whereof I know. I said in 1945, I could have, I said it in all the large cities of America, I could have gone to all to any insane asylum in America and picked out the 30 worst cases and put them in as rulers of the 30 greatest governments for the last 30 years, and at the end of those 30 years, the world wouldn't be any worse off than it is today, and I couldn't find anyone willing to debate it with me. <laughs> if I could have picked out 30 ministers from little towns, little churches, even pick them out, but they were ignorant. If they had these qualities and put them in charge of those 30 governments, we'd have prevented both those world wars. And, I, and you know it, and I know it. That's what I call education. If you don't get that education, all the other kind is just going to take us in the wrong way, in the wrong place. And so... <clears throat> To love greatly and don't be afraid to love. And know that uh, heaven is a infinitely better place than this and that the uh, goal of all love is ultimately to be in heaven. And if one of your loved ones is taken a little ahead of time, that creates a wistfulness in you. Oh, when my brother went, that wistfulness. I have often said before audiences, I said I, uh, the first night I was here, that I'd like to call up their assets, your, your sorrows and your sufferings and so on. That's where the strength comes. If I could have my choice of all the wealth in the world and all the wistfulness in the world, I'd take all the wistfulness. It all comes out of that long wistfulness. Here is Frank Laubach, three boys. Two of them died over there. People wonder the wonderful power that comes into a ball of Frank Lamba. Magic, creating 200 languages, reaching uh, all over the world. But it's all come from. And then from that defeat, when he failed to be elected to the head of the theological seminary in the Philippines, and it bittered him. And then he was ashamed of himself after two years, and he said, Lord, forgive me. He sent me the hardest place. And he sent him to the Moros, the headhunters, where he couldn't even speak uh, about Jesus. So he just, for two years, he'd just go up and vision the hill and with wistfulness, just love them and wistfulness. Poured that wistfulness into some little letters he sent to his father. They came out as the letters of a modern wist a mystic. They'll go down through history. Oh, the wistfulness of uh, Saul of Tarsus. Uh, St. Paul, as he wrote that letter on love to the Corinthians, and that was a group that didn't know how to love. And it's gone down through history. You'll find all the great things come out of uh, a great love and a wistfulness that goes with it. Uh, when uh, my book, The Souls and Serious Hour, came out, um, the editor, that was Cedric, put on the jacket, and it's still on the jacket. If you look out there, you'll see. This man finds prayers natural as breathing, and all his prayers are answered. And I knew my wife hated ballyhoo or overpraise, and I did too. And I said to my wife, I'm going to write Ellery Cedric to take that off. And to my amazement, she said, no, Glenn, I wouldn't bother. I've noticed that ever since your mother died three years ago, all your prayers have been answered. Oh, how I love my mother, how she loved me, her oldest son. She had great hopes for me to be something of a prophet or something, but her wishes, on the, as long as she was in this flesh, it's bound up with the tensions of her body and the 
in the ambitions of her mind. The moment she stepped into heaven, her wishes became multiplied in power by infinity, and the great power came. I would be on these journeys if my wife hadn't stepped into heaven after 30 happy years of married life. Twelve years ago, and uh, we loved uh, to be together, and she wouldn't have been strong enough to pay these journeys. I said, now I'm, the whole nation's my home, and whenever I really need help, I just say, you're a little closer up there to the Lord. You just speak to him a little closer, Louise, and you just ask that he speak through me tonight. There's going to be a, a difficult situation to me. And it always comes through with great power.